This is John Golan, and this is part three on my series on aircraft performance and mission analysis. And today I'm going to be focusing on turn rate and acceleration. Now, aircraft performance embodies a wide range of measures. Things such as takeoff distance, landing speed, stall speed, all of these are different performance measures that can be calculated for different aircraft configurations. And most of these measures are common to both commercial and military aircraft applications. What we're going to be focusing on here, however, are the class of metrics that have become central to the performance of most military aircraft today, which is to say acceleration, which is also sometimes measured as climb rate or time to altitude, and turn rate. Once we have the drag puller for an aircraft in hand, together with some basic aircraft parameters, it becomes possible to undertake a wide range of performance calculations, such, for example, as the maximum load factor portrayed here. Now, the load factor calculation is going to be dependent on a number of different components. We can see, for example, a relationship to the thrust-to-weight ratio. And as expected, higher thrust-to-weight ratio leads to superior sustained or maximum load factor. We also see that there is an inverse relationship to the wing loading. So lower wing loading leads to better sustained maximum load factor. Also in this relationship we can see some of our old familiar friends from the drag polar. For example, the zero lift drag coefficient makes an appearance. We'll note, however, that the zero lift drag coefficient is divided by the wing loading squared. So this is a relatively weak relationship. The relationship of maximum sustained load factor to thrust to weight ratio will be much stronger than the dependency on the zero lift drag coefficient. We can also see in here a direct relationship to the aspect ratio of the aircraft and the odds walls efficiency or the aerodynamic efficiency of the aircraft. Aerodynamic efficiency again, pay, plays a very strong role. There's also a dependency on the airplane angle of attack. Now this is a relatively weak dependency in the sense that we have the angle of attack cosine on the one hand, which for low angle of attack will be close to one, and the angle of attack sine term times the thrust to weight ratio on the other hand. So what this means is, is that for low angle of attack approximations, we can actually drop the relationship, the direct relationship to thrust to weight ratio, uh, which would be appropriate for a civilian airliner. For high performance aircraft, you need to keep that relationship in there. Once you have the maximum load factor, maximum sustained load factor that an aircraft can undergo in pocket, it then becomes possible to calculate the associated turn rate. So again, if you have max sustained load factor, that will tell you what the max sustained turn rate will be. What we're going to see is that some of the same basic aircraft parameters will appear over and over again when we make different performance out calculations. What will differ will be the relative weight that each of these parameters has over the outcome of that particular measure. For example, if we look at the maximum instantaneous load factor that an aircraft can achieve, we will find that it is directly related to the maximum lift coefficient that the design is capable of, and that is, it is inversely related to the wing loading. So lower wing loading translates directly into superior maximum instantaneous load factor, assuming all else is equal. Now there is a relationship to thrust to weight ratio, however it is tempered by the fact that it's multiplied by the sine of the angle of attack. So this is a much weaker relationship to thrust to weight than what we saw previously for the maximum sustained load factor. Likewise, if we move on to, say, a specific excess power measure, which is a measure of acceleration or climb rate, we will see that specific excess power will decrease with increased load factor. In other words, if I'm at a higher G level, I have less excess energy available to accelerate with. Similarly, if I'm at a lower G level, 
I have more excess energy and I can climb or accelerate. We can also see that the specific excess power is related to the thrust to weight ratio as we should surmise for pretty much any measure of acceleration. And it does have a relationship on the lift to drag ratio which again contains the whole of the drag polar embedded into that particular number. Now if we rearrange specific excess power such that we are looking at the concurrent load factor associated with it, we get a relationship that looks like this. In this relationship we can see that specific excess power allows us to either increase or decrease the amount of loading that the aircraft can undertake. In other words, if I want to accelerate or climb, then my max available load factor is going to be reduced. Now for first order approximations, quite often what will be done is aircraft will be judged on the basis of their thrust to weight ratio and their wing loading very very similar to the constraint diagrams that we saw before. So in this kind of relationship what we'll see is higher turn rate corresponds to lower wing loading and superior acceleration corresponds to higher thrust to weight ratio. Now this is a good first approximation but we also have to remember is that when we're comparing dissimilar aircraft, especially aircraft from different eras, that this representation leaves out the effects of aerodynamic efficiency, which also can have a powerful impact on turn rate or acceleration. So if we portray different aircraft for comparison purposes, in a manner reminiscent of a constraint diagram with thrust loading on one axis and wing loading on the other, we can begin to draw some conclusions about trends in both instantaneous turn rate and acceleration. Now, in order to keep this relevant, we need to make sure that we have some of the common ground on which to evaluate the aircraft. So in this particular example, uh, we've specified 50% internal fuel, two air-to-air -air missiles only, so to try to keep the playing field level between some of the older aircraft and some of the more modern aircraft. And there's also been adjustment made for thrust laps uh, just to try to get us in the ballpark of what a actual aircraft in flight would look like. And from this we can see some of the classical matchups from history such as the MiG-15 and the F-86 Sabre from the Korean War era Again, on the surface of it, it looks like the MiG absolutely has some, some wonderful advantages. However, in practice, as some of us know, there were two major elements that the Sabre crews had going for them. One was superior training, far superior training at the time, and the other of which was control, which we'll talk about separately a little bit later. Similarly, we can draw a comparison between the MiG-21 of the Vietnam War era and the F-4E Phantom from that same era. Uh, and it kind of reaffirms what many of us are aware of, which was that in a turning engagement, the MiG had an enormous advantage over the Phantom. If we look at a aircraft such as the F-16, for example, which has undergone a lot of evolution since it was first introduced, we can begin to see how that evolution has played out. So in the case of the F-16, as new abilities and additional payload capabilities have been added, the weight of the aircraft kept going up and up and up and up. Now, they did continue to add additional thrust as the aircraft evolved, so the thrust to weight ratio stayed kind of constant. But the wing loading continued to get progressively higher and higher with each evolution of the F-16. If we take a look at the nearest derivative of the F-16 that came during the 1990s, the Japanese F-2, we can see that one of the things that the Japanese did was they increased the wing area of the aircraft, effectively restoring the wing loading of the original F-16A, the old Block 10, Block 15 type aircraft, while at the same time 
taking advantage of superior engine thrust to give them a larger aircraft with more range and payload. Again, you can only restore wing loading if you're willing to invest in a new wing design, which is very expensive and which most aircraft never actually attempt to undertake during their lifetime. Now another interesting matchup or comparison here would be to take a look at the Eurofighter Typhoon. Now the Typhoon was developed as a dedicated air-to-air -air asset. That was what it was originally conceived of. Yes, it will do multi-role type things, but the original vision was to optimize the air-to-air -air capabilities of this aircraft. Now, in the formative years of the concept for the Typhoon, as some of us know, there were a number of studies that were undertaken and that were actually published out of Europe. And those studies were basically, among other things, trying to decide what was the maximum amount of thrust, what was the maximum thrust to weight ratio that the Europeans could afford to develop and still be able to buy a significant number of aircraft. And the Typhoon basically sits right where the maximum is that the Europeans ultimately decided we can afford to develop an engine to go with this particular thrust to weight ratio combination and still buy enough aircraft to be credible. On the other side of the Atlantic you have the F-22 and the United States with a slightly larger budget was able to far exceed the thrust to weight ratio that the Typhoon was able to achieve. And the reasons for that should be obvious. The United States has the resources to, to do these kind of things, which the, uh, the Europeans at the time lacked. You can also see that both of these aircraft clearly are biased towards the air-to-air -air role. Very low wing loading, relatively high thrust-to-weight ratio. Both of these aircraft are excellent in the air-to-air -air mission. It just so happens that the F-22, the Raptor, is in a class by itself. Nobody else has the resources to develop an aircraft that can do what the Raptor can do. So the other thing to keep in mind when you're looking at these is that you can make a lot of comparisons. It tells you the trends. It tells you good estimate for what acceleration advantage one aircraft might have over another. And a little bit about the instantaneous turn rate Sustained turn rate is more complicated because it depends on both thrust to weight ratio and wing loading. But what is missing from this comparison, this simplified assessment, is the Oswald's efficiency, the aerodynamic efficiency. So there is another dimension to this plot. You can think of it as being a vertical dimension out of the page. And that dimension is not fully captured in this particular relationship.